Hello, and welcome to a show that we call About Pembroke. My name's Russ Bullock, and the purpose of this show is to bring topics of interest to you, Pembroke citizens, things you may not know about your community, and items of topical interest. For instance, did you know that Pembroke has a clock winder? Well, it does, and it has had one for many, many years. The purpose of the clock winder is to wind a town-owned clock that's located in the first church right here behind me. There are lots of other people that know more about this than I do, and maybe we I'd like to go in and talk to them right now. So come on inside the church and let's find out a little bit more about the clock, the bell tower, and the town clock winder. Uh, this clock was made by Aaron Willard Jr. in Boston, 1837. Aaron Jr. worked from 1804 until about 1850. Hi, I'm inside the First Church of Pembroke with Karen Proctor. Karen is the research director for the Pembroke Historical Society, church historian for the First Church of Pembroke, and as most of you know, is the author of a bi-monthly column in the Pembroke Mariner entitled Pembroke's Past. Obviously, I couldn't pick anybody better to talk about this subject and subjects historical about Pembroke than Karen, and she's agreed to come here and tell us a little bit about the First Church itself, the clock mechanism, and the bell. Okay, well, in order to establish a town back in the 1700s, you needed to have a church that was established, and you needed to have a settled minister. So in 1712, First Church in Pembroke was established, and they settled Reverend, Reverend Daniel Lewis as the first minister. This is actually the third meeting house on the site. The first one was nothing more than really a shed, and it was located on... Uh, High Street in an area called Sabday Orchard. Well, they eventually moved the shed here, but it was too small for the growing population of Pembroke. So in 1727, they replaced it with a larger structure that had a spire, and it's also believed that it had a bell in the spire. Uh, in 1792, the parish began to consider the removal of the steeple, and in 1805, it was taken down. This left the town without a bell to toll the deaths of its residents or call people to meetings until 1837, when this present building was designed by Alexander Paris and was built. Uh, it, as you know, has a large belfry where the bell hung. In 1838, the town voted to pay a sum of money not to exceed $20 for the ringing and the tolling of the bell. In 1839, the bell cracked while it was ringing for a fire in the Marshfield Woods, which caused the need for a replacement. And it was said that the old bell had rung a true A tone, but the bell we have today is a little bit flat. With the new bell came the Aaron Willard clock, which tradition tells us was pre presented to the town by the Reverend Morrill Allen, who was the fifth minister of the parish, and it was given to the town, providing that the town pay for the maintenance. It was, that went along just fine until 1852, the town paid for repairs for the first time for the clock. Um, until 1854, the church was paying for the running of the clock, but in that year, the church chose Nathan Simmons to take care of the clock and the bell and paid him $5 above the original 20 he received from the town. Since that time, the town has regularly paid for the expense of running as well as repairing the clock. With Henry Baker began the long tenure of clock care, which lasted from 1878 to 1907, when he died. He was elected annually by the town, thus kind of blurring the lines between the church and the town care of the clock. While in the process of choosing a replacement for Mr. Baker in 1907, selectmen questioned the ownership of the clock. In the absence of any formal agreement, the fact that the clock was attached to the first parish church caused it to become yeah, part of realty and therefore the property of the church. Since the church did not press the claim, a waiver was prepared and the town took over the maintenance of the clock. The selectmen appointed Frank Cat Crafts as the caretaker. Eventually, Elliot Ford, church sexton, and also a town caretaker, took charge of the clock until he began to find it difficult to climb the steep, narrow steps to the clock tower. As a special tribute in 1997, when Elliot Ray, Church Sexton, and succeeding clock caretaker Dewey Jensen stopped the clock just before Elliot's funeral and restarted it again after the events of the day. Dewey was in charge of the clock duties for seven or eight years and was followed by Jim Madden and eventually the gentleman who's running, who uh, winds it today, Bob Hines. 
On April 8, 1893, the clock tower was struck by lightning, which destroyed the belfry and scattered the parts of the clock in all directions. Repair seemed impossible, but George Allen of Situate, who was the uh, grandson of Morrill Allen, the donor of the clock, really wanted his grandfather's memory to be perpetuated. So Henry Baker went all over the area and rounded up the parts. Um, some of them had been taken as souvenirs, and there's a legend that said that parts of the, um, the dial were actually found in Bridgewater. He reconstructed the clock, and repair was paid for by Mr. Allen. So the clock really has a very strong history of, of uh, town and church relationship, but as far as, as uh, we know today, it's definitely the ownership of the town. Thanks, Karen. So I guess the bell itself predates the clock because that was the original yes. apparatus. Well, this is, yeah, it's not the original bell because that was replaced. But um, I believe the bell might have been before the clock was actually put in. But they were both, the new bell was about the same time. And I guess, uh, I guess it's interesting to note that the town was uh, paying for the clock winder and the ringing of the bell even as far back as 1838 yes. when they were uh, paying the sum not to exceed $20 a year. And I think the clock winder currently gets quarterly payments of $250 uh, for the job of climbing all the way up there and making sure that that clock's wound. And so I guess we're getting a pretty good bargain if you account for inflation from uh, 1838. It's a, thanks, Karen. I really appreciate you spending the time. It's a, a lot of good information there. And we're going to go up and take a look at the clock here in, in just a little bit. Um, but first, we want to talk to a couple other people who have a knowledge of what's been going on with the clock and the bell over the past uh, few years. Yeah, it takes about 65 cranks to get the weight from the bottom to the top. I have to do that once a week. Anytime. Okay, it's a pretty accurate clock. I have to adjust the time every couple of weeks. But as I wind it, it also loses some time. But other than that, it, it's pretty, pretty accurate. And to my immediate left, I have Dewey Jensen, the first church sexton and former clock winder himself. And to his left, Alan Peterson, a facilities manager here in town and a member of the Board of Deacons. Thanks for uh, sharing some time with us this afternoon to talk a little bit about the, the clock mechanism itself and uh, the bell as it sits as it sits today. Dewey, you've, uh, you did a number of years, you were the clock winder here in town. Can you tell us a little bit about the clock itself, some of your experience with it, uh, what the mechanism's like to work with, and, uh, and maybe some of, the, uh, some of the little stories you have about uh, what's been going on with it? Well, I don't know, <coughs> I don't know how much I'll be going to be able to tell you. Uh, I think that I owned the clock for about eight years until I had trouble getting up into the bell tower. Uh, I know that uh, I could tell you a few, quite a few people have done repairs on the clock. One of them is Tony Trotter from Pembroke, who used to work for Richie Compass, has made parts for the clock. I've made parts for the clock myself. And uh, another one of the clock winders has, has replaced one of the cables in the in the clock on his own uh, out of his own pocket uh, other than that uh, there's really not much to tell it's not the easiest job in the world there are one two three flights of stairs plus two ladders that you have to climb to get up there and then if you want to get up into the bell tower you have to there's a little hatchway that you have to go up through and if you're a little bit overweight you won't make it through there the subject. Well, I've heard a lot about the clock winders over the years taking a lot of the expenses on to uh, make repairs t to the clocks, and that's certainly appreciated. It is a wonderful old piece of machinery. It's a, a black paint with a gold leaf inscription from uh, uh, the Reverend Allen who made the donation of it. Uh, 1837, I believe, is inscripted on it. And on the level above that, which is accessed through a much smaller ladder, and I barely fit through the ladder way up to the bell itself, um, that was a replacement bell, which is probably five or ten years different than the clock itself. But there was a interaction between the bell and the clock. The clock actually has two halves. Uh, one half drives the uh, hands on the clock, and it's probably, was it a 500 pound piece of granite that the cable pulls up? 500 
I mean, if, if, people, if people knew that's what was above their head when they came in the door to the church, they'd really understand the meaning of faith. Um, and there's a similar sized piece of granite on the left side of the clock, which uh, would operate and used to operate the hammer mechanism. And it's interesting, the hammer truly is a, a hammer. It looks like a, a metal smith's anvil type hammer. Uh, and that's laying next to the clock now with some of the parts and pieces because uh, over the years the belfry is worn so the, cl the bell is now fixed in one location. It was rebuilt, the bell tower, around 1997, was it? Around there. Yeah, and um, it was a economical repair. We didn't make it up as robust as we would have liked to, but uh, we all know what budgets are. So um, the, the, the bell did swing and ring for a few years there. Then uh, I think I was on Deacons back then on an earlier shift. And uh, it was a good hook to get the kids to be acolytes if they could ring the bell. And for a while, we had problems with the bell. So I figured out if you keep the bell still and move the clapper, that, uh, that makes the bell ring. And uh, we came up with a way that you still have the feel like you're swinging the bell. Um, so now the bell's fixed in one place, which makes it a lot easier for the anvil mechanism to work. And it'd be wonderful to get that to ring on the hour again like it used to when I first came to town here 22 years ago. Joey, can you talk a little bit about the maintenance of the clock? What needs to be done to keep it going in, in good working order? Well, it has, to be, it has to be oiled, probably should be oiled like every three months. And uh, come uh, when, the, when, the, when it comes winter time, uh, the the clock winder usually has to he has to readjust the uh, the uh, the pendulum. He might have to lengthen it out or shorten it up, whatever, to uh, keep the time. And that and that is a very 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 accurate clock for a piece of mechanism that big. Uh, other than that, I I can't really tell you. I can't really give you much information on that. I know Elliot when Elliot had. Uh, when Elliot was winding the clock, he had a little, uh, a little glass ink well that had uh, had the oil in it and a little brush, and he had to go and put a couple of drops of oil in each one of the bearings, and uh, that's actually what uh, that little bit of maintenance. It really doesn't. It really doesn't take that much maintenance on the clock itself. Well, uh, th thanks for thanks for spending a couple of minutes with us. Um, of course, now we've got the, the town meeting coming up. There's a warrant item on on the uh, on fixing the the bell to get it back in, in good working order. And uh, so our decision to come down here and take a look at the clock winder is, is pretty fortuitous. Um, do we tell us a little bit about um, how you got that ball rolling and, and uh, what you did to get it on the warrant? Well. <clears throat> I had to go to town clerk and uh, and I requested the uh, petition papers, and she gave me like five sheets of paper. I had to have uh, I had to have at least a hundred legible, legible and legal signs signatures on the paper. As it turned out, we got 125, and uh, out, of, out of that 125, we did have a hundred. So. It has to go on. It has to go on the ballot. Uh, it has to go in the warrant for November one. November one. I've seen a draft of the warrant, and it and it is on there. And I know you're working with Alan here to see just exactly what it's going to take um, to get things back online and have have the have the uh, bell ring uh, in concert, I guess, if you will, with the clock. And Alan, you've you've gone up there and you've already talked a little bit about some of the changes you made to kind of simplify uh, what needs to be done. What else do you think uh, we'll need to do? To, uh, kind of a broad overview of what needs to be done in order to get that thing back uh, on track and ringing in in with the uh, with the uh, with the clock itself. Oh, there appear to be a number of linkages that are missing. You can see the holes in the wooden structure of the steeple where the rods and levers used to go to uh, hold the hammer so it would strike the bell. Um, so somebody has to reinvent a lot of those and people who have seen it in years past would probably uh, be able to be very helpful to recreating a lot of those parts. Um, 
most of the parts are still on hand, and a few will probably have to be uh, rebuilt or reinvented. But it is a very basic technology setup. It's just levers and wheels and counterweights. And the clock has all the working mechanism there to drive that. It's just a matter of harnessing that and getting it to uh, uh, move the uh, hammer to strike the bell up above. Well, it sounds like it's uh, probably harder than it sounds, um, but I, you know, I, I seem to recall as a kid bells tolling here around town, and uh, um, I think even though the, uh, Karen calls it a flat A at this point, that, that um, having church bells is part of what living in a community like Pembroke is all about. So um, I'm certainly going to have my support for this, and hopefully as people take a look at, uh, at this program and learn more about the clock, and uh, what, you're, what you're really asking for, I think that you're going to garner a lot of support. So thank you both for coming down here and spending a little time this afternoon uh, to talk with us about uh, the clock, the clock winder, and the bell. Well, and that's the story of the town clock winder. I'd like to thank Karen Proctor, Alan Peterson, Dewey Jensen, and Bob Hines for spending some time with us today to talk a little bit about town history and one of the things that I think makes this town really special. Thanks again for watching and hope to see you next time when we're about Pembroke.